Welcome to this act of worship from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar. Thanks go this week to Paul and Sally Thompson for our readings and to the choristers of St Martin in the Fields for our hymns. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we begin our worship, let us think of the week that has passed and all that has happened in it. The resurrection of Jesus proclaims that love is stronger than hatred, hope is stronger than despair, life is stronger than death. So we can turn to God in faith and trust, just as we are, and know that nothing we have done is beyond his power to forgive. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, raise us who trust in him from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that we may seek those things which are above, where he reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts. The next day their rulers, elders and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for ever. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, says the familiar psalm we heard just now. He leads me beside still waters. I'm reading a book about leadership at the moment. It's been highly recommended by other vicars during this pandemic it's called How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going. The title really says it all, doesn't it? How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going. It was written by Susan Beaumont just before this pandemic struck, but it certainly found its moment. I'm sure many of us can identify with that question. What should we do? What decisions should we make when we don't know what the future holds? It's something that's relevant to everyone. You don't have to be the CEO of a big company 
or the Archbishop of Canterbury, or even the local vicar, to find yourself having to take a lead sometimes, at work, at home, or in the community. If you have a caring responsibility for children, or for other vulnerable family members, you're a leader. If you take the initiative in supporting a friend in need, you're a leader. Leadership comes in many forms. And there's a sense in which we're all leaders of our own lives, even if we don't feel we lead anyone else. We have to make decisions for ourselves, prod ourselves into action when we'd rather just stay in bed, set ourselves on one course or another. But as the book's title put, puts it, how do you lead when you don't know where you're going? The book calls those times of confusion liminal times. Limen is the Latin word for a threshold, the place you have to step over as you go in and out of a house, from one place to another. Liminal times are times of change, times when we find ourselves stepping into new situations, whether we wanted to or not. Life is full of them. The first day at school or college, starting a career, moving house, the beginning or the end of a relationship. A time of serious illness can be a liminal time, and so can retirement and bereavement. I'm sure we can all think of plenty of examples from our own lives. Even if the change is a happy one, like getting married or starting your dream job, liminal times can be very unsettling. For a while, everything seems different, but eventually, if we hang on, we get used to the new routines, the new shape of the world around us. What seemed alien becomes familiar. It might feel better, it might feel worse than what we had before, but eventually it at least stops feeling so strange. Often liminal times are personal, just affecting us and our family. But over this last year, we've been going through a sort of collective liminal time, or perhaps more accurately, a prolonged series of liminal times. We've been locked down, opened up, put into tears, encouraged to stay at home, to go to work, to eat out, to help out, allowed to travel, banned from travelling. We hardly have time to take in one set of rules before we get another one. No wonder our heads are spinning. No wonder we feel so disorientated. No wonder we feel like we don't know where we're going or how we can hope to lead others for whom we may be responsible. And that brings us to today's Gospel reading, a passage with leadership at its heart, which was written by and for people who knew all about liminal times, times of change and disruption, times when they didn't know where they were going. Like most of the Bible, the Gospels were written against a backdrop of trouble and uncertainty. Israel was often at the mercy of the powerful nations around about it, struggling for control over this strategically important country which stood at the meeting point of Asia, Africa and Europe. At the time of Jesus and the early church, it was the Romans who were top dogs. Their rule was often brutal and they cracked down ruthlessly on anyone who threatened their power or refused to fit in. Jesus and his followers, like so many others, lived with constant uncertainty, powerlessness, the knowledge that everything they relied on could be swept away in an instant if Rome decided they were in the way. Many of the first Christians had embraced huge changes when they decided to follow Christ too losing family, friends and security. All their old certainties were gone. They lived in a constant state of liminality, with things changing around them. But somehow they hung on to their message, the message of God's love, shown in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that message took root, and it still nourishes people today. How did they keep going? How did they not give up in despair? How have Christians over the centuries not given up in despair? It wasn't because they had some secret knowledge of the future, a road map or a compass or a crystal ball. 
They didn't know where they were going any more than we do. But they knew who was going with them. God himself. And they knew that it was safe to trust him because the resurrection of Jesus showed that even death couldn't destroy his love. Jesus was the shepherd who didn't run away when he saw the wolf to pick up the imagery of today's Gospel reading. To understand its images, we need to know that in Jesus' time and place, sheep weren't kept in nice, neat fields. They lived on the open hillsides in wild terrain. Their shepherds, often young boys, would lead them from one pasture to another to find food and water, just as the familiar words of Psalm 23 describe. But how do you get a flock of sheep to follow you in a vast wilderness? A lone shepherd can't round them up and drive them. They have to want to come with you. The theologian Paula Gooder describes this way of life still in action in modern Israel. I'll never forget the sight of four or five Bedouin shepherd boys, she says, early in the morning, calling to their flock, nor how, when this happened, the large flock split into groups to gather in front of their own shepherd. Each shepherd knew which sheep would follow them, and each sheep knew which was their shepherd. Or, of course, as Jesus puts it, I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. My sheep, he says, will listen to my voice. It's all rooted in relationships, this sort of shepherding. Jesus' relationship with his Father and our relationship with Jesus. That relationship is shaped by time spent with God in prayer, in reading the Bible, in serving others, in doing the things he calls us to. When we don't know where we are or where we are going, when our hearts are disoriented, the answer isn't to look for the certainty of a detailed itinerary, even if that were possible. It's to orient ourselves towards God, towards good, towards love, towards hope. We don't know what's around the next corner or over the horizon, but we can know the one who walks beside us, who is faithful in his love of us. And when we know that, we shall not be in want. There is nothing we lack, as the psalm says. So how do we lead when we don't know where we're going in liminal times? Whether we're leading a nation, a business, a church, a family, or just our own lives? The answer, it seems to me, is that we first need to follow listening for the voice of the shepherd, who loves us more than we can imagine, so much that he even lays down his life for us. Amen. Let us pray. God, our good shepherd, lead us through these changing and turbulent times. Help us to listen for your voice amidst the tumult and noise around us and within us. Turn our disoriented hearts towards you, towards goodness, towards love and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our good shepherd, we give you thanks for the green pastures and still waters in our lives, for all that nourishes and refreshes us, for the glory of the springtime, for the love of family and friends, for your word and for one another. Help us to cherish this world and all that is in it. We pray for all who are seeking to address the threat of climate change, and that you would show us each how to make our own response to it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Good Shepherd, we pray for all who need to find right pathways for themselves and for others for the leaders of nations and communities, for those who have the power to affect the lives of many for good or ill. Give wisdom and compassion to all in authority. We pray especially for nations struggling to respond to the Covid crisis, for India and Brazil 
and other countries whose health systems are buckling under the strain, that we might find ways to share medical resources justly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Good Shepherd, we pray for all who are in distress today, in the dark valleys of sickness, grief or loneliness. Comfort them with your presence in the darkness with them, and give wisdom to those who care for others, that they might know how to help them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Good Shepherd, We give you thanks for your promise that we are all welcome at the feast in your kingdom, both now and in the world to come. We entrust to you all who have died and those who mourn their deaths, that we and they might know your goodness and mercy and dwell in your house forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we share the peace, we hold in our minds those from whom we are separated. Members of our congregation, our families, our friends. And we remember that in God's hands we are all held together. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Almighty God, who raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high, may we know your resurrection power in our daily lives and look with hope to that day when we shall see you face to face and share in your glory, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen.